Um, this is my first time meeting the San Diego Insight Sangha. So nice to meet you all. And uh, I want to begin with, <laughs> I would like to begin with uh, some time of meditation. <clears throat> and then after the meditation, we'll have a short break. And then uh, I'll offer a Dhamma talk and we can have some time of Q&A at the end. So please find a posture that's comfortable enough for meditation. Where, you, <clears throat> where you're supported, you know, your body's support, supported in whatever way you need. <clears throat> so if you're able to sit, then to um, find a, a chair or a cushion that supports your spine to be in alignment as best as it can be. So propping up the base of the spine so that the spine can just, you can imagine the vertebrae like, um, sometimes people speak of them like a coin stacked one on top of the other just beginning at the base of the spine and bringing your attention up through your vertebrae. Just getting a sense as you, as you pay attention to your spine, you start to notice when there's uh, maybe a leaning one way or another or a bending forward or collapsing of the chest. So just allow this attention of your spine on your spine to naturally kind of realign your body as much as your body will realign. Don't have to force anything. And just to bring your attention inward so sometimes it's helpful to close your eyes, but if you're sleepy, then you can keep your eyes open, but I would recommend not gazing at the screen, but have your eyes down, maybe just, to, just in front of you, a little bit lowered, so that you're limiting the sense imp in input. If you need to lay down during the meditation if you're not able to sit for physical reasons then similar criteria you know you try and have your spine as straight as you can without forcing in any way but just so that the energy can move naturally up the body and again limit your sensory input you can have your eyes partly closed or closed. You just have to be careful if you're lying down not to fall asleep. So being aware of the body in this posture for meditation. And feel the weight of your body as you, as it's in contact with the with your seat or with the ground. Just touch into the direct experience of this body sitting here or lying here. Knowing how it feels, not thinking about it, but just how does it feel right now to sit here? And when I say feel, I'm not talking about emotional feeling actually, but the actual direct. So as I sit here, I feel pressure on my bum and on my legs, just not hard, just a little bit. And I feel hot, I feel heat, a little bit prickly. And I feel some softness and I can feel my clothes on the body. So just see what you can feel that brings you into connection with this body, your body sitting here.
And be aware of the space above and around your body. That there's room for you, you can take this space. Just be aware of how with each breath, with each breath the body, much of the body moves with each breath, each in-breath and each out-breath. The body is engaged in the breathing process. We don't have to do it. The, the thinking mind doesn't have to make it happen. The body simply breathes, knows how to do that. And with each breath, we're also, you know, the, the, the space that is around us, the space that we're sitting in, is breathed into our body. We can't really separate the inner and the outer. So breathing that air in and breathing out. So there's space around us and there's space in our lungs, in our nostrils. Just being aware of the process of breathing, of the body breathing. Noticing the texture of the in-breath and seeing is it the same as the texture of the out-breath. Might be that the in breath feels cooler than the out breath. So just noticing the very ordinary and somehow miraculous process of breathing. So just letting your attention rest on the breath. Maybe there's lots of thoughts pulling your attention this way and that. So you can just tell those thoughts, for now we're doing this. For now, we're gonna be mindful with breathing. Breathing in and breathing out.
We're coming to the end of our formal meditation together. I'd like to just have a short break for a few minutes and uh, if you need to stretch or do anything this is the time to do it but I'd just like to invite you to stay mindful in whatever you're doing keep your keep your awareness in the body it's so easy just to just go into the next thing the mind runs off so just to see you don't have to move slowly or anything but just stay present these next minutes and then we'll come back uh, in in about in uh, five minutes and i'll offer some words on the four noble truths okay so uh, i'd like to begin by paying homage to my teacher the buddha um any any wisdom any wisdom that comes through is uh, it wasn't there before i came across the buddha's teaching so I'd like to uh, start with paying homage to the Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa putang tamang sankang namasami So, uh, you know, we live in challenging times. And, um, you know, I have, I don't know most of you, so I have no idea how your lives have been affected by the pandemic or are being affected. And uh, by numerous other things that can happen in a life. And I wanted to speak this evening on the, speak a little bit about the Four Noble Truths that the Buddha was that actually the, from the first teaching that the Buddha gave after his enlightenment, uh, he, he went searching for people who might understand the teaching that he had this, this subtle and kind of profound teaching that he'd realized through his own practice. And so after try, trying a few possibilities, he ended up uh, returning to a group of ascetic practitioners who he'd been living with for some years and who he'd left in order to follow the path that he felt would be his well, really he was following his intuition actually recognizing that the way he was practicing wasn't working it was there was it was too tough too austere and there was not enough uh, sense of well-being so I'm just seeing little puppy snuggling there there was not enough sense of well-being to uh, to have wholesome states arise and so he left these uh, these ascetic practitioners and found the path the, you know the, the path to full awakening and then he went back to those same people to share what he'd learned and uh, you know so what he taught them was the the middle way extremes of uh, sensual indulgence and ascetic practices and uh, he also taught the four noble truths and this was the first 
teaching that I ever heard in Buddhism. I read it actually in a book and it was profoundly life changing for me to hear this teaching and it may or may not be for you, who knows. But uh, the, the beginning, the first noble truth that the Buddha points out is there is dukkha. So this word dukkha has been translated in different ways and in the old old translations, which, I, which was what I was reading back then, it was a long time ago, and they were old translations then, the, it was translated as suffering. There is suffering. Um, it's actually the word is more nuanced than that. So it's more like um, it could be suffering at one end of the spectrum, and it could just be a very slight, yeah, you know, I want things to be a little bit different. You know, it can be anywhere in between those, those uh, two. And uh, so it's basically being at odds with things as they are. Being at odds with things as they are is uh, leads you know brings up dukkha and um so the, the first noble truth there is dukkha and the second noble truth there is a cause there's a cause to dukkha and the cause of dukkha is clinging attachment um and specifically clinging to things that are changing, which is perhaps you might know is, is everything, everything, including ourselves, including the, the uh, room that we're in, including the planet Earth that we're sitting on, that we're part of, including the universe. Everything is changing, everything. So holding on to what is changing clinging to what is changing, trying to keep stable what is unstable is the cause of dukkha. And then uh, there is a cessation of dukkha. And uh, the cessation of dukkha comes through letting go, letting be, uh, being with things as they are. And there is the path that leads to the cessation or the ending of dukkha. And that path is the Noble Eightfold Path. So uh, I realized as I was uh, earlier today is that this, you know, I could kind of talk for a week about the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. There's so much in it. There's so much there. And we have a little time. But I'll just list the Eightfold Path. And I want to start, so it's, um, it's often translated as, the, the first word Samma is often translated as right or wise. Wise is a little bit of an odd translation. Right, it's, uh, well, the word that works for me better is attuned. Attuned to the, to awakening, attuned to the, to uh, freedom. So uh, like a, like tuning an instrument, you know, when it's in tune, it's, it sounds beautiful. When it's out of tune, it's either too sharp, too flat, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't sound good. So I, I think of it in that way as uh, the samma is a tune. So there's um, a view, samma ditti, view or, or understanding that is attuned, attuned to awakening and there is thought or intention that is attuned to the path and speech action livelihood these qualities that are attuned to the path and mindfulness and collectedness that are attuned to the path. So the Noble Eightfold Path is this, this uh, attunement of one's life and it covers uh, body, speech and mind. It covers pretty much everything that happens in a life actually. So it's aligning one's life with, with the path and not just with 
what we want and what we don't want. So this is the Noble Eightfold Path that leads to the ending of Dukkha. And it's, it's a, you know, you may have heard about the Eightfold Path a lot. You'd be like, oh yeah, Eightfold Path, you know. And, but this path is the path to liberation and it's practical. It's something that you can pick up and use. So, uh, you know, check it out and see, you know, uh, to what degree is, is your life aligned with that? And where, where are the places that it's really hard to, uh, to stay aligned? Where are the places where you need to work harder at aligning with that noble eightfold path? Because it's, it's a liberating path. And not just at the end, you know, I mean, it is obviously at the end of the path, there's the complete freedom, but also in the process, in the process of understanding that everything is changing there is a letting go. There is um, there is more ease around the reality of life, life and death. It's it's seen for what it is. It's, it's normal. It's accepted. There's more of a a resting into life as it is, which is up and down. And uh, you know, when we when we align our thoughts with uh, letting go, renunciation, you know, not not always having to get what we want, and with uh, thoughts of kindness and compassion, or, then the world changes. The way we see the world changes. So you know the way we use our thoughts is very very important. We can we can think that it doesn't really matter. You know, we do this. You know, we look good and we try and do things that look right in public, and then privately the thoughts are all over the place and, and you know hateful and and you know jealous and whatever it might be, greedy. And then we like, well, nobody can see, so it doesn't really matter. But the thing is, when that when we indulge in those thoughts and we just let them let them run, of course they come up until we until we're quite far on the path. Those thoughts can arise, but you know we take care around them because if you just let them run quietly in the background, they gain more and more momentum and they start to influence the whole of your life. So uh, you know our speech comes from, begins with thought. Our actions begin with thought. And uh, so taking care of, of the way we use our mind is very, very important. So with this Noble Eightfold Path, the, the first, sorry, with the, with the Four Noble Truths, the first truth is this truth of dukkha and i think you know as a society america is very geared towards not being aligned with that truth probably actually most countries most you know cultures we want to see what's good what's wonderful you know we want to like let's just use positive thinking and just get over this and there can be all of that and uh, you know in in america there's this um curious um culture of you know aging is seen as like a failure <laughs> and death you know the ultimate failure it complicates things doesn't it because it's just natural part of life so you know if we if we think it should if life should you know if we think nature should be different to how it is then we suffer then we create problems if we think we shouldn't get old we should never get sick and dying is a failure then we're, we're bound for a lot of dukkha or if we think we should always be successful always be healthy always be young you know 
it's not like that so you know life presents a constant uh it's like you know you, you you gain something with one hand and you lose something with the other it's it's like that all the time there's no way around that that is the nature of this realm that we live in and to align one's heart and mind with that is peaceful it's it can even be joyful so we have this chant that uh, is done in the monasteries that, that uh, reflects on the, the five subjects for frequent recollection. Some of you might be familiar with them. And the first one is, um, I am of the nature to age. I am not exempt from aging. I am of the nature to sicken. I'm not exempt from sickness. I am of the nature to die. I'm not exempt from dying. All that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. And then the, the fifth one is, I am the owner of my karma, heir to my karma, born of my karma, related to my karma, abide supported by my karma. And karma literally means action, action with intention. That's the meaning of the word karma in the Buddhist way of framework. So uh, what I do with intention has results. And, uh, and where I am, you know, how I, and it's very much where one's, when, where one's heart and mind is, is the, the result of past action with intention so what we bring to the moment is very very important regardless of what the moment brings to us you know whether it's uh, loss sickness or um, an unexpected windfall or you know uh, whatever it might be positive or negative you know or or in between what we bring to that with our own hearts and minds is the is the karma the karma that we're making now so you know people can go through very difficult times have incredibly difficult situations and still manage to somehow use that either for for, for like profound letting go or they can see a silver lining and still have some um you know, see some blessings even in, in the most challenging situations. So uh, how we use our mind and what we put our attention on is, is key. It's a key aspect of the practice. It's, it's very, very important. And we live in a time, as so I've, I've sometimes heard it called a you know, that we, we're surrounded by weapons of mass distraction because we, you know, cell phones and laptops and games and all of this stuff. So we've got all these the Mara's weapons of mass distraction. And uh, so we have to really be careful how we use our attention. It's so easy just to get pulled into things and, and, uh, and lost. And, you know, hours go by and we wonder what, what, what happened, you know, can be like that. So to, to take really good care, to this life is precious, to take really good care of where are you, where are you putting your attention? Where are the places where there are big leaks? Where the, your attention is leaking? And, uh, you know, this is, some, this is something that you can, you know, you don't have to even tell anyone. It might be embarrassing. You might feel embarrassed. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's that again. So if that's, it's, it's okay. You know, you just, we all have those places where attention leaks out here and there into, into whatever it is, distraction or 
um, just finding some pleasure in some way, trying to get away from the, the actual experience of being here. So just be aware of what is it, you know, do you, I'd like to invite you really to investigate that today, tonight. Where are the places where your attention gets drained, gets leaks out, gets wasted? And then see, you know, see if you can find a wholesome replacement for that. So just, just cutting things off doesn't always work. Sometimes it does work, but often we need to find something. We need to sort of take it step by step and find some way that we can guide our attention towards something that's more beneficial. So just, it's, it's an internal exploration and uh, something that you can you know, pick up and, and do, practice guiding your attention in the right direction. And, uh, and it's also important to, to appreciate the, the good and to know to notice the good in yourself, you know, to notice, you know, appreciate the generosity and the, you know, the ethics that you keep. Even if it's not perfect, to appreciate what's already good. So this first noble truth of dukkha, it's, uh, it's said that dukkha, there, the Buddha would use this phrase, there is dukkha. And then he said, dukkha should be understood. So our tendency, you know, when things are difficult is to immediately want to turn away, to immediately want to distract ourselves uh, or to uh, push away what is difficult. But the Buddha is inviting us to investigate it. Dukkha should be understood. And when I lived with Ajahn Sumedho years ago, he would, he would talk about standing under it, stand under Dukkha, let it rain on you. Stand right under it, don't be afraid of it. It's your teacher. So uh, If it's if you're, you know, don't start with something too big because then you can just be too overwhelmed. But you may find that there is some there are things that are not so huge, and they're often feelings. It's often a feeling somewhere in the body, somewhere in the belly, or in the heart, or in the chest, and the, and it's oh, there's that feeling. I don't want to go there, and then you distract yourself. So to take an interest, to get curious, to have courage, the courage to feel, and to know, you know, a feeling is just a feeling. It is changing. It won't last forever. And uh, if we can if we can have the courage to turn towards those places which are often qu kind of quiet grumblings or quiet quietly shutting down you know they're, they're, they're often sort of not super obvious but if we can have the courage to be curious and turn towards them and be interested and listen to them then they can have a chance to reveal themselves and be released so they're not always released immediately sometimes it takes a while but sometimes it's it is immediate but our fears you know we, we can be so we so don't want to have to be present with our fears we just try and try and uh, make things certain let's just make things certain pin everything down you know then it'll be all right, then we'll be safe. But of course, you can't pin things down for very long because like with a butterfly, you know, you pin it down and it's and you've killed it. So it's, uh, we can't really pin down life. So we have to, like it or not, be with this ever-changing, somewhat unpredictable process of life. 
takes a certain courage to really acknowledge that and step into it. But the fact is we're in it anyway. So we may as well take a conscious step, not try and run away, not try and put it in a box. So understanding dukkha. So, the, so there is dukkha, dukkha should be understood and then dukkha has been understood. So there's, there's three aspects of the, the first noble truth. And then there is a cause. The cause of dukkha should be let go of. The cause of dukkha has been let go of. So we do this with little things. We do it with many little things and then that prepares us for the big letting go. And then there's the cessation of dukkha. The cessation of dukkha should be realized. The cessation of dukkha has been realized. This is the three aspects of the third noble truth. So again, you know, this is, there's the big realization, the ultimate realization where all dukkha, all, all unsatisfactoriness, all suffering is, is ended forever. That's the big one. But there are many little cessations that we also need to pay attention to. So like uh, simple things like pain in my knee. You know, if one's sitting on a retreat, pain in the knee becomes a really big deal. And you start worrying that you're going to be wheeled out in a wheelchair from the retreat because your knee's hurting. And, you know, then you then the bell rings at the end of the meditation, you move and you find that the pain's completely gone. So noticing that's the cessation, there's a cessation there, noticing that. Or you're feeling anxious about something and then either the, the something happens and you no longer feel have to feel anxious or maybe the anxiety just fades away, passes. There's a cessation there, noticing that cessation. So paying attention to the ending of things. So the, the, the um, cessation of dukkha should be realized and the cessation of dukkha has been realized. And there's the path, the Noble Eightfold Path that leads to the cessation of dukkha that I just mentioned, which is, a, it's a, you know, that's a, something to please look into it further. I'm really just skimming over the surface of it and that uh, the the path should be cultivated and the path has been cultivated so these are the the 12 aspects of the four noble truths and uh, you know these truths you know, i love that they're called noble truths you know they're, they're like and that the first truth is there is dukkha. To me, that's deeply compassionate. When I first heard that, I was just was so touched that the Buddha took care to say that. Because certainly it was my experience, you know, I was experiencing that a lot. And when I was uh, in my teens, you know, as many teenagers do, and nobody seemed to be talking about it. People were talking about future and um, possibilities and you know all the things that can happen and, and good things and it's like yes all those good things can happen and there are not so good things happening too so what do you do with that you know and there was also um, you know growing up as a Christian uh, there was also this this story of you know when you if, you, if you're good, you know, do good things, then when you die, then you'll go to heaven. And if you're bad and you do bad things, then when you die, you're gonna to go to hell. 
So this wasn't a great paradigm. I wasn't feeling too um, confident about my chances of heaven at the time. And uh, one of the things I found so beautiful in this teaching of the Buddha is he's not saying, um, at least in this teaching, he's not saying, you know, do good, be a good person, and then all your life, and then you'll at the end you'll you'll go to heaven. He's not saying that. He's saying freedom can be found here and now. And this is the path. This is the path to freedom. And he's saying that as someone who, who has realized that for himself, who's, who knows that. It's not a theory, it's not as he's read it in a book. Somebody hasn't told him about it. He's realized that for himself. And he's passing that information on and here you know 2600 years later we still have that teaching that path is still open it's a very very precious map that we've been given so uh, you know it's up to us to walk that path it doesn't it doesn't it's not enough to read about it it's not enough to listen to somebody talking about it and feel inspired. It's that those things can help us, but we have to walk that path. It's, uh, it's practical. It's accessible. And it leads to awakening. And in the process, you know, it's, it's even this thing of, you know, many people I know who practice, they don't even think about enlightenment. They don't want to think about oh no enlightenment that's, what is that and it's too much and you know that's okay you don't have to have um you don't have to think you know we don't really know what it is until we know what it is anyway so you don't have to have that as your goal but as you practice the noble eightfold path life becomes lighter And one, you know, because we are al aligning ourselves with, with what is beneficial and uh, wise and kind. We're, we're realigning our lives. And, you know, sometimes we can think like, oh, well, I'm like this, you know, I'm this kind of person. So, you know, and especially that you know, I'm, I'm a Buddhist monastic, so you can say, oh, well, she's a Buddhist nun, so. You know, I'm not, it's different. But actually, we're all human beings. We all have our strengths and weaknesses. And it's only when we hold on to that identity of, of who we think we are, of what we've done in the past, or of who we're going to become in the future or not become in the future, it's when we hold on to that identity that we're stuck then we, we're recreating, we, we're, we're imagining and creating somebody. We're not actually aligned with the Dhamma. The Dhamma is, is pointing to change. It's pointing to constant flux. It's pointing to, you know, how we can guide our, not, you know, not just our life in terms of what we're doing, but our whole being how we can guide that, how that can be guided towards wisdom, compassion, and truth. So, you know, if you have that story going on in your mind that says, oh, well, you know, I'm, I can't because da 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 da. I, I know that story very well. I've had that story play out. It's, it's not, uh, founded on anything however however many times you may have heard it however strong it may be however believable it might sound it doesn't have a foundation it's uh, it's just a story so you know practicing in alignment with this path 
it changes who we are. It changes how we manifest in the world. It changes the world in a little way. So I like to think about Ajahn Chah. And Ajahn Chah was, um, I didn't actually meet him, but he was the, the first, I guess, really deep inspiration in a way that I had and I heard teachings from by proxy. And he was a, a very simple, he, he came from, he was a, from a farming village in uh, northeast Thailand, which is a very poor area, very, very poor. Um, you know, the land is not very, very rich, not very, not very fertile. And so there's hard work and you have to work hard to, to make a living. And he wasn't very, you know, he, he, I think he was grade eight. He did it in school, something like that. He didn't, he wasn't uh, well educated and conditions were not that easy for him. And yet he became an enlightened being. You know, he, he realized full awakening through his practice and uh, was able to share the Dhamma with many people. And so in all, you know, many people, so like in America, in, in uh, Europe, in Australia, and, and in Thailand, very much in Thailand, his teachings have, have changed, you know, thousands of people's lives. Just one little guy who was, you know, had tendency, was a bit lustful you know, by nature and, uh, and had some tenacity and, uh, and some wisdom. You know, it made a huge impact. So anyway, so I want to offer that for you this evening as a reminder that uh, you are heirs to this teaching. We are all, we have all, we're all part of the, the Buddha's family in a way. And this is his inheritance to us, this path. So don't squander it and don't just leave it in the bank, you know. Use it well. <laughs>